Happy Saturday and welcome to Scottish Summit 2021. Uh, it's great that you're here watching this talk. Very, very excited. Uh, I'd like to call out a big thank you to all our sponsors who, without their generous contributions, none of this could ever happen, especially in years like 2020 and 2021. So um, I'm here to talk to you about rendering 3D worlds in C Sharp. Because this is an online event, I'm going to be around in the chat afterwards for any questions. Unless they're about maths, where I will happily refer to you, refer you to the Wikipedia documentation, I say as half a joke. So firstly, let me introduce myself. My name's David, and I'm an independent software consultant based in London in the UK. I work for myself, mostly taking roles mentoring developers and doing strategic work for big UK dot-coms, where I've done a wide variety of jobs with variably pretentious titles like Head of Engineering and Chief Technical Architect, head principal engineer, and they all sound a lot fancier than they really are, because the truth is that I just love making things and the people that make things, and as a result I try and spend my time helping and doing people making really, really cool stuff. I've written a couple of kids' books about programming websites and games in JavaScript, Get Coding 1 and 2, available in many regional languages and all good bookstores, that's the end of the plug, and recently I built a 3D renderer in just plain old C Sharp, just to see if I could. Now, why on earth would you do that? I know, I know, it's all a bit pointless really, but isn't that the fun of experimentation? There's a lot of different answers to this question, but firstly, I really just wanted to see if I could. So often, we are forced to live in this brutalistic corporate hellhole where only things that have to exist for money get rendered into reality, and this entire endeavour is the opposite of that. 3D engines exist. If you want to build a game, you probably shouldn't do anything I'm doing in this talk. It would be a complete waste of time and effort. You should go download Unity and make an awesome game. But if you want to do some silly things to see what you're capable of, please come with me on this journey. Now, I'm not a graphics programmer, and I came to this whole topic really pretty cold. So before we get going, I would just like to caveat a few things about sequencing and history in this talk. So we're going to be talking about technological advancement from a period where things were being invented and reinvented over and over. And I'm going to be talking about things in sequence here that appear to have come after other things. But in fact, we're really being worked on simultaneously. So for every game I mentioned, there were doubtless other games that came before it or were riffing on similar themes at the same time. So please do not feel slighted if I forget to mention your own personal favourite game. I'm absolutely sure it's awesome, and I'm absolutely sure it's important. What what makes something 3D? You know, so before we we do a deep dive, it's important to understand what three-dimensional images, what 3D actually means. Now, your computer monitors are two-dimensional. They literally have a two-axis. There's an axis X and there's an axis Y. They render flat images. So when you try and draw by hand something that looks 3D on a 2D space, it often looks strange and wrong. So the screenshot here is from Rampage, and it's definitely, definitely in 2D. But it's clearly trying to represent a 3D space, while definitely not being a 3D image. It's not even pseudo-3D. You know, there really are only two planes, from left to right and up to down, in this particular image. So making a two-dimensional image three-dimensional is not about the fidelity of the image, but in fact it's about how it captures perspective. Now perspective is an art technique for creating an illusion of 3D, so on a, especially on a 2D surface. So the correct use of perspective was one of the great inventions of 15th century art, often credited to Leon Battista Alberti in his book On Painting from you know, 1435 if we're looking for modern technology. So Alberti outlined what is now known as linear perspective, which plots a horizon and a vanishing point, with and then it positions elements along those lines to simulate depth. Linear perspective is just one kind of projection, though. So a projection is a graphical technique that maps three-dimensional points into a two-dimensional space. It's an engineering and fine art discipline and can be learnt because it is mostly a mathematical exercise. So projections come in many forms, defined by where their focal points are placed. Accurate perspective, accurate perspective projections, then, are what makes something look three-dimensional 
in a two-dimensional space. Now, one-point perspective is the most common three-dimensional projection in games today. It's the first-person shooter perspective, with a single camera from the focal point of the main character, but over time, games have used other perspectives for various reasons. Early games often favoured orthographic perspectives. These were isometric renderings of 3D into 2D. Now, we'd still probably consider these 2D games, but they were technically representing three-dimensional space. Isometric perspective is useful for games because all the objects inside the 3D space remain the same size wherever they occur, and in early games, scaling things in size was computationally expensive. So it's worth remembering that when we talk about 3D today, what we're really referring to is polygonal 3D. And actually, gaming has had a history of pre-polygonal 3D graphics that's worth considering, along with this journey that we took towards high performance polygonal 3D. So this is a screenshot from the very recent Unreal Engine 5 demo, which is due out sometime in 2021. And you really, honestly, you have to marvel at its absolute beauty and the sheer weight of research and technical excellence behind it. You know, there are literally billions of polygons in this image, millions on each rock, each decorated with 4K scanned textures mapped onto objects. There's global illumination, modelled light rays that bounce off surfaces, there's depth of field, particle effects, material simulation, all implemented in pixel shaders on specialist GPUs that can crunch all that maths. Now, modern 3D is an accumulation of three decades of work in polygonal 3D rendering. But to really appreciate modern 3D, it's kind of important to grasp the road travelled to the destination and to appreciate some of the things that you might not think were 3D, but secretly kind of really were all along the way. So we started off with early vector-based games in the 1970s. In the left we have Tempest, and the right we have Maze War. Now long before general purpose 3D, way way back in the 70s, we had what appeared to be 3D graphics in vector-based games. Hopefully this should challenge your idea of what 3D really means. So if we look at the screenshot of Maze War, this was a 3D first-person shooter written in 1973, running on a PDS-1 computer. It was made up of what appeared to be empty, hollow polygons, but was actually something very different. These polygons didn't exist in the game code. They were the result of line drawing operations on vector monitors. Now, vector monitors were not divided into pixels like modern displays, instead having more in common to the displays of an oscilloscope. This was a trend that continued into the early 80s. You see, the surface of a vector display screen is a single layer of phosphor. It emits light wherever the electron gun hits it, and this meant if programmers were creative enough, they could manually in their code instruct the display to draw whatever shapes they wanted as if drawing and plotting the lines on paper. Games like Tempest, Asteroid, and the early Star Wars arcade game and games and consoles like the Vectrex managed to look way ahead of their time. Now, vector-based games in some respects were a natural evolution from the game Tennis for Two, which was the very first video game, which was actually played on an oscilloscope display. The Vectrex actually was a fascinating console because it was born of a Smith Engineering employee working out a way to clear their stocks of a surplus of CRT vector-based displays that were originally manufactured for medical use. Now, there was only one run of these consoles as a result, making them relatively expensive collector's items today. During the 70s and early 80s, there was a broad shift towards raster graphics displays. When compared to vector displays, where you could draw anything, anywhere, raster displays use bitmap graphics. What that means is that the display is divided into pixels, usually directly mapped to an area of memory. Now, rather than effectively infinite resolution of vector displays, Raster displays operate at set resolutions. You've all used them, I promise. You're using one now. They're the screens that you know and love. Now, raster displays provided a level of hardware abstraction over the low-level drawing of vector displays. Vector displays had to be redrawn repeatedly to keep the image on the display, whereas raster displays were predictable, with fixed refresh rates, and they were easier to standardise as a result. While raster displays were common, going all the way back to Pong in 1972, 
Over time, the use of vector displays became less and less common, with the arcade industry using raster displays by the 1980s, despite notable exceptions like the Star Wars arcade games from the previous slide. Now, the games of the 80s that featured 3D often used artistic technique to simulate 3D, which was really just a raster graphics approach to the earlier line-drawing 3D of vector graphics games. This time, though, in higher fidelity, with richer colours. So occasionally, like in the case of Atari's iRobot in the top left here, specialised hardware was built into the arcade cabinets themselves to support drawing polygons quickly. In, in this particular case, a custom 3D coprocessor. So pictured here, we have Atari's iRobot, using a custom processor, Falcon, and LucasArts Rescue on Fractalis. Now, the Sega Super Scalar series of arcade boards powered games like Space Harrier and Afterburner. And um, Sega had become adept at sprite-based pixel art in their arcade games and had started on their own journey towards texture map 3D by implementing hardware sprite scaling to provide perspective. That this kind of fast sprite scaling was far beyond the capabilities of home consoles of the mid-80s. They introduced the Super Scalar arcade graphics technology with the game Hang-On in 1985, and Suzuki is quoted as saying that the Super Scalar games were designed as 3D games. They then simulated 3D using sprite scaling to get that look of texture map three dimensions, while looking more impressive than early 3D polygon graphics in the process. In fact, the Super Scalar technology was similar to the much-hyped Mode 7 graphics mode of the Super Nintendo, which included hardware support for the background layer of sprites to be rotated and scaled on a scanline by scanline basis. So this technique formed the foundation of the graphics for Super Mario Kart and F-Zero and Pilot Wings, amongst countless other games. In fact, Sega was so good at scaling and rotating sprites that it even formed the foundation of the Sega Saturn console which was very similar to the final Super Scalar arcade boards in hardware design. So Eurogamer's Digital Foundry did an excellent retrospective on the original Tomb Raider game where they used an emulator to unskew the Saturn's quad-based rendering engine, which it favoured over polygons. And as you can see in the top screenshot, what that really meant was that 3D on the Saturn was constructed by skewed and mapped square textures to generate polygonal 3D. So ironically, this gave the Saturn its reputation for being hard to program, and probably contributed to its defeat at the hands of the Sony PlayStation, which made large bets on true polygonal 3D. In the early 90s, there was the slow and lumbering lurch into true polygonal 3D. These early 3D implementations were really, really rough. Um, all the way until the mid-90s, early 3D was very low poly, meaning that the 3D models that the hardware of the time could cope with were low in complexity. You know, these engines were slow, and the art style possible with the relatively crude forms of 3D render at the rendering at the time was pretty rough. So this stuff hasn't aged particularly well. In fact, given the relative quality of true 3D in the early 90s, you can perhaps understand what Sega was thinking when designing the Saturn, unwilling to dispose of two decades worth of 2D experience so quickly, you know, especially when their pseudo 3D was really pretty fast. You know, that said, Sega themselves took their first stab at true 3D with virtual racing in the August of 1992, initially a proof of concept application for exercising their then new 3D graphics platform um, that was under development called Model 1. Now, the late 80s had seen a few polygonal titles in arcades from Atari and Namco, but none with the poly count and performance of Sega's new Model 1 board. They followed, up, they followed this up with Virtua Fighter, another huge, huge hit. So, while there were plenty of games reaching for the real 3D at the time, it was probably a mixture of Mario 64 in the September of 1996, Tomb Raider in the October of 1996, and Quake in the June of 1996, that really solidified what polygonal 3D games could actually be. Now, Sega Saturn had shipped with home ports of Virtua Racing and Virtua Fighter very late in 1994, but with the release of the PlayStation and the N64, it kind of set the scene for the mid to late 90s 3D game explosion, with those first games that felt like they were really the first that made complex 3D games mainstream. You know, there were plenty of other games doing 3D between 1994 and 1996, but it's easy to remember just how ropey some of those game design conventions were. 
and because this was almost entirely new territory at the time for the designers building the games. But these three games, Mario, Tomb Raider and Quake, you know, they really locked down some of the conventions of games that stick around today. Things like 3D camera control, first person perspectives and interactivity. Of the three, Tomb Raider has probably aged the worst due to some unfortunate control scheme choices probably made at a time when there were no default control schemes for 3D games. Now, Mario 64 amazingly is still as playable today as ever and its recent remaster on the Switch kind of shows how timeless that game really is. Um, Quake holds up entirely as the first real-time 3D network multiplayer game that actually worked well. So a quick recap before we go on. We've talked about three ways of simulating 3D through the early video game arcade industry. We've talked about vector line drawing that projected 3D. We've talked about early orthographic projections to remember to render isometric viewpoints. And we've talked about sprite scaling to simulate 3D models and then obviously the advent of true 3D polygon graphics. But we haven't really talked very much about speed and we've not talked much about the home computing market. So PC gaming is really an alternate timeline to kind of the console and arcade world. So there's this parallel thread in 1990s PC gaming. So the PC existed in an alternate universe from games development for consoles and arcades at the time. The IBM PC standardised in the early 80s but wasn't really seen as a thing for play and it was targeted towards business users. So we were kind of still at the tail end of the 1980s microcomputing trend, especially in the UK, with systems like the Atari ST and the Commodore Amiga being much more common in the home. Now that's not to say that there weren't games on the PC in the 80s, but the kind of games were often slow, occasionally text-based, not very similar to the games popular on consoles at the time. Adventure games like the King's Quest series or Elite and Load Runner and the Zork trilogy were what people thought of when they thought about PC gaming. These slow, laborious, point-and-click adventures and simulation games. Now, not graphically rich, not fast-paced, certainly not games like Mario or Sonic. It was conventional wisdom that PCs just weren't capable of that kind of performance that more specialised gaming systems really were. So let me tell you about a game that's secretly really important. Now in 1991, a company called Softdisk put out this game called Hover Tank 3D. And they put it out as part of their Gamer's Edge series of monthly discs. It's a series curated by a man called John Romero. Now Softdisk had made a name for themselves as part of the burgeoning shareware scene, and it was one of many games they put out. It's described like this. <clears throat> Hover Tank 3D is set during a nuclear war. The player controls Brick Sledge, a mercenary hired by an unknown organisation referred to by the game as the UFA, to rescue people from cities under the threat of nuclear attack, largely political activists or scientists, both by the government and by large corporations. However, the cities are also full of mutated humans, strange creatures, armed guards and enemy hover tanks. Right, that sounds like it could be any other 1980s game, right? So, Hover Tank 3D was a little bit more important than that, though. So, the four people that were working on the Gamer's Edge publication at the time were John Carmack, John Romero, Adrian Carmack, obligatory mention to the fact there's no relation, and Tom Hall. Now, the people who were going to become the four founders of prolific game studio id Software. Now, all of these are wonderfully 90s photos. I, I especially like the, the pure romance captured in the photo on the right. That's totally my jam. And in their evenings, while working at Softdisk, they were taking their work computers home with them to work on what would later become id Software games. Now, the team had just cloned Super Mario Bros. 3 for the PC, something that at the time was deemed impossible. Like, literally nobody believed smooth scrolling could really reach the performance of the NES original, especially not on the PC hardware of the early 90s. Now this slide is a screenshot from that specific PC port. They had sat for a week tracing, literally with pen and paper, the original game on a CRT television and cloning its gameplay. Now Nintendo politely declined the port and told them that they couldn't use it. That led to them building and releasing Commander Keen. Commander Keen was a 2D um, side-scrolling platformer 
on PC, not at all suspiciously using exactly the same technology. In another world, Super Mario Bros. 3 might have been released on the PC, and id Software may have been bought by Nintendo, and we may have never played Doom. Now, Hovertank 3D was the game they built to follow Commander Keen, and was their first 3D engine. It took six weeks to build, and compared to other pseudo-3D engines at the time, it was, like, really fast. It was the game engine that would form the prototype of the Wolfenstein 3D engine, which would later become the foundation of the engine behind the game Doom. Now, id would go on to develop Quake, its sequels, Rage, along with many more Doom games. Carmack would eventually serve as CTO of Oculus VR. Uh, these games were renowned for their speed. It's what made them playable and addictive, along with pioneering online multiplayer, game modding, and open source in games. Now, part of the reason these games ran so well is because of how their graphics engines worked, and they worked around the hardware constraints at the time. Now, Doom used a technique called BSP, Binary Space Partitioning, for its rendering, but we're not going to deep dive into that right here. We're going to start with Wolfenstein 3D and how its renderer worked. If you're interested in more information about the history of id Software, there's a really great book about it called by David Kushner called Masters of Doom. It's from 2003 and it's on the Kindle and all good bookstores and all that. It's a really fun read and it's an interesting story through like the arcades and early PC gaming scene. It's really good. So how do we make things fast in 3D? There's really only two things you need to know about making things run fast in 3D. Render as little as possible and do maths really, really quickly. I mean, I half joke, but it's kind of as true in 2020 as it was in 1991. The games industry today is full of clever optimization techniques to work out how to render the absolute least things possible. And we're going to look at a technique called ray casting that was the basis of both Hovertank 3D and Wolfenstein 3D's game engine. And it was an early approach to make things run fast. So ray casting is the use of ray surface intersection tests to solve a variety of problems in 3D computer graphics and computational geometry. The term was first used in computer graphics in 1982 in a paper written by Scott Roth to describe a method for rendering constructive solid geometry models. Thanks, Wikipedia. Wolf 3D uses ray casting to convert a 2D level design, a flat maze seen here, into a 3D projection and we're going to dissect and clone this behavior. So, how would we convert that map, which is actually a real-life Wolf 3D map, into a 3D world that we can run around? So, I've drawn a crude map on this slide, and it's a big empty room with two blocks inside of it. Now, towards the bottom of the map, I've drawn a circle, which represents our camera that's facing north. If we were to imagine that camera casts rays, drawing straight lines from every part of its field of view, it might look something like the lines drawn from our camera point. Now the number of rays we're casting here isn't that important, but in a real worked example, it'd be related to the focal length of the camera, combined with the number of pixels of the output image. Now the further a ray has to travel from its origin, the camera, before it makes contact with something, the further away that thing is. So we've got eight rays in this example. Now, imagine that we record the distance each of our rays travels and we fill up some columns. The further a ray travels, the fewer the pixels we fill up in our column. Now, our first ray was really close to the left-hand block, so we're filling up lots of pixels. The second is clipping the side of our left-hand block, so again, we fill up quite a few pixels, but a little bit less than the first ray. Now, the third through sixth rays are shooting way off into the distance before they make contact with a wall surface, so we fill up almost no pixels. Once we reach our 7th and 8th rays, we're connecting with the right-hand block and filling up our columns again. Now, when represented like this, it doesn't look especially 3D. However, if we centre the pixels that we filled in vertically, making sure that there's the same amount of space equally divided above and below our pixels, suddenly it looks like we've got a representation of a 3D world with a wall in the far distance and some blocks to our left and right that are near to us. Now, this is fundamentally how ray casting works in practice. You shoot a number of rays from left to right and you measure the distance they travel before they connect with a surface. 
If the surface is solid, the rays stop. If the surface isn't, they can continue to travel and connect with other surfaces. This approach is faster than other rendering techniques for that order objects on their that, that order objects on the Z index, how far away from the camera they are, and then render them furthest away object first. So this approach, while while working, requires multiple passes over pixels to correctly construct the image. So ray 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 casting is really useful. We'll set a max range on our camera, so our rays simply give up if they don't make contact with anything off into the far distance. So we can now express the number of pixels in any given column as a percentage of that total distance. We calculate the percentage of vertical pixels to fill up in any given column as the distance travelled divided by the camera range times 100. So by doing this calculation and measuring the distance a ray travels, and by knowing the height of our target screen, we can calculate how many pixels we need to fill up. We're projecting our 2D plane into a 3D space. So we've looked at how we can use ray casting to determine the distance between an arbitrary camera and surfaces in a 2D space, but how do we practically turn this into an image? The simplest way possible, really, we just cast a ray for each and every horizontal pixel of our target output image. So while in our worked example here we were only considering eight rays cast, it's not computationally too expensive to cast many more. So for a target resolution of 1024 by 768, we would cast 1024 rays, one for each horizontal pixel. Similarly, in a resolution of 1920 by 1080 full HD, we'd cast 1920 rays. So, let's build our own 3D engine. Let's do it. And of course, because this is kind of a C-sharp twinge talk, not a history of video game graphics session, I suppose we should probably write some code. What we're going to do is we're going to define our own map format. We're going to write the simplest ray caster that I can fit inside some slides. And we're going to do one or two bits of scary looking maths to someone like me who stopped studying maths at 16. And finally, we're going to render our own 3D world. So look at this, our finest 3D game level. Be astounded by our two cubes in a room. I can just feel the cover shooter gameplay brewing right now. I can hear you yell. Now this is a bog standard file new project default.net core 3.1 console application. I've added two static variables, max camera range set to 50, a random number, well magic number, and a string called a string array called world. Now we're going to put our level data into that string array using my innovative new data storage format. It's called hashes for walls, coming 2021 to the gaming world. Um, for the sake of this example, any space that has a height of zero and any hash has a height of one. We're also going to set up our camera located as a location 2D. This is just a struct that contains two properties, X and Y. Now the camera is going to be located 10 characters in and seven rows down in our array, facing to the right by default. Our ray is a list of sample points. A sample point has a location that it is sampling along with storing the length of this part of the ray and the total distance travelled. The idea is that as we write code to walk through our map, we'll just append a sample point to the list, the list as we go. The final sample point that connects with a surface will always be the last sample point in the array. You'll notice that we have a property in the sample point called surface. Now in our map we only have two kinds of surfaces, a wall or nothing at all. Um, when we detect surfaces later on, we'll store a reference to the surface we're detecting here. Now there's a lot going on here, so let's work through this method to cast our rays slowly. We're going to create a new result, an array of sample points exactly the width of our desired image. Remember, each horizontal pixel needs its own ray casting. We're then going to perform a for loop for each pixel in our target horizontal resolution and we're going to shoot a ray. We work out our x value and the angle of the ray that we want to cast by taking our column number, dividing by the render width and subtracting 0.5. What this does is effectively takes our desired camera angle and splits it into columns and then positions our camera in the center of the column that we've calculated the location of. So we create our origin sample point at the location of our camera 
and we're then going to work out which direction to cast our ray. This is one of those maths things that you weren't paying attention to in school. Now, don't worry, neither was I, and I had to like look this up, like age 35. So a radian is a standard unit of angular measures. It describes how many degrees around a full circle that you are. So the direction in degrees we want to cast our ray is pi over 180 times by our camera direction plus an additional camera angle offset. So we're returning a cast direction offset object created from our direction in degrees. So let's talk about cast direction. This is some a little bit of scary trigonometry. Um, a little bit more maths than you might have been sleeping that you might have been sleeping through in high school, I suppose. So our cast direction object contains the sine and the cosine of the direction we provided that was expressed in radians. Now remember that the radians are just what direction on the circle we are pointing. Sine and cosine are two of the main functions used in trigonometry, and they calculate the ratio of two of sides of a right angle triangle. In our case, they're going to help us work out how far left and right we need to cast our rays from our starting point. This is the core of our ray casting algorithm. So we loop forwards, walking one step at a time, following the shortest path the ray can take. We do this by using the sine and cosine along with the current steps x and y values to calculate what the length of one step forward on that line would be. So we compare the length of each step that we can choose and we pick the shortest path. And once we know what it is, we call a function called inspect, telling it to either shift 1x or 1y in any given direction. Inspect returns a sample point which will store any detected surface. If the next step has no height, well we just continue onwards, stepping forwards, working out whether we're going one up or one to the left or right. If we're at our max camera depth, we return the whole ray path as is. And if we reach something with a height, well, we found a surface. So we store our current sample point and return our completed traced path. It's the complete ray. So let's take a look into how we determine what the next step to take actually is. So what this block of confusing looking code does is given an angle in degrees and a pair of coordinates, it calculates what the next step forward along our line would be. We call it with the sine and cosine values we created when we created our cast direction object. Now this feels really mathsy, and it was certainly an eyeful when I first tried working it out. But what we're doing is to calculate an x next step, we take our cosine value called run here, and if it's greater than zero, we add one. If it's less, we subtract one. This is inverted when we call this method for our y next step. The sine value becomes run, so our y has one added or subtracted to it. Now we record the change in length and we generate a new location 2D coordinate. If the first value x is if the first value is x, we just return that location. If it's y, we need to flip our x and y coordinates because we've called this method with our parameters flipped around. There are likely much prettier ways to express this concept, but it's what I have for the moment, so we're going to run with it. Our inspect method shifts either x or y by 1. This depends on if x or y was the shortest path when we, we call our function. It calls the detect, service, the, sorry, the detect surface function, which converts our double down to an integer, the x and y location in our original string array, and the surface at function just checks which character is at that location. So if it's a wall, it returns a surface with a height of one. Otherwise, it returns a static nothing instance. Now, these values are consumed by the loop back up in the ray function, which evaluates this response to work out if the ray has collided with a surface or not. In a more comprehensive implementation, other characters could return surfaces of varying heights and rays could continue onwards past things that were only partially obstructed and show the, you know, return the height of whatever the, is behind them, rather than in our implementation here where we just stop as soon as we reach any surface. Different characters could be used to return different surfaces with different characteristics, and maybe different textures. So, after casting our rays, 
we have a total distance value for each point on our horizontal axis. But we need to do a little bit more work to convert this into an image that might look like something. I've split out these two steps to make them more explicable, but you could merge cast rays and render bitmap together if you really wanted to. So the bitmap renderer is responsible for taking our array of completed rays and working out exactly how many pixels to fill up in each vertical column. We're then writing the bitmap to a memory stream and saving it to the disk so we can open it up in an image editor. There's nothing interesting there. Let's dive deeply into our height calculation so you can see how this works. So, firstly, our image width and image height are 1024 by 768 in this case, a standard, if small, in 2021 resolution. So firstly, we're creating a new image using the wonderful Image Sharp library. Um, we set it to our desired width and height. Now, Image Sharp is an open source image manipulation library written in pure C Sharp. It doesn't rely on any legacy interop, so it's fully cross platform, unlike many of the legacy image manipulation APIs that maybe we've had access to in .NET before. Next, we're going to loop around each sample point in our column. Now, this column integer is actually also our X coordinate for our image. Uh, then we're going to work out the number of pixels we need to fill in. We do this by taking the height, multiplying it by the height of our surface, which is going to be either 0 or 1, um, depending on if we found a surface or not. That's the maximum number of pixels that we can possibly fill in. Then we're just dividing it by the distance travelled, so the further we travel, the smaller our height becomes. We're also dividing our distance travelled by 2.5 to let our walls become a little bit taller. So we're calculating our ver vertical padding, the space above and below the pixels that don't contain our surface. We're taking our full image height, subtracting the height of our pixels and dividing by two. So we're adding padding on the top and bottom. Now all we do is we loop over our y-axis, starting at the vertical padding number to skip the top of our image and up until the image height minus our vertical padding. So this makes sure we leave the same amount of space at the top and bottom of our picture. So for all of the pixels we want to populate, we're setting their RGB value to 200, 200, 200, which is like a murky white color. And oh my god, we actually have a ray traced image in our output directory. Now that felt like a long journey, but we're still literally inside 200 lines of code here in total. And that's cool because that looks like a 3D world. You can see our walls projecting out towards our focal point in the distance. You can see our two blocks. That's some like AAA game design there. And um, they stand there in white. So let's update our code to call a new select texture method. So we're going to do some really quick back of the envelope maths here and treat RGB 200, 200, 200, our murky off-white color, as the maximum brightness that we're going to render. Now, the further away the wall is from the camera, the dimmer will make it to simulate fading off into the distance. In a real game engine, we'd, we'd use this function to look up texture mapped pixels from a source texture, but for now we're just going to use flat colors. And, and here we are, a black and white image that represents our string array map rendered into 3D with our own raycaster. Like, how amazing is that? So, cool, see this gradient? I like this gradient very much. I made it in a minute or two in paint.net, and it might seem like much, but it's my gradient. Now, the reason I love this gradient is that I can use it to cheat and I can use it to provide additional texturing to the floor and ceiling of my raycaster while writing practically no code. So instead of creating our world from a blank image, if we load this gradient into our bitmap before we render our world, it'll come out looking like we had a floor and a ceiling all along. This is especially sneaky because our world is still technically a 2D plane projected into 3D. Now this is exactly how all the games like Wolfenstein 3D faked having their extra dimensions. Like, there was no floor or ceiling. You should always cheat. How about that? See? Doesn't it just feel that bit more real? Now, <laughs> this is a screenshot of a higher resolution render that I crammed into a WinForms UI so I could hook up keyboard controls. You'll probably laugh. It's literally just a picture box control that I'm putting the bytes from the bitmap into and I'm updating it at 60 frames per second. 
but hey, I mean, good enough to play with. I'm sure Digital Foundry could do a frame rate capture on it. It'd be great. So <laughs> wiring up controls in WinForms was a really simple task. I'm just subscribing to the on key down events and adjusting the location 2D property on my camera to add a first person shooter style WASD control scheme. I think I spent literally 15 minutes hooking up these bits in WinForms just so that I could have fun swinging my camera around in real time. Uh, a switch statement updates a property. That's it. I was almost alarmed at how simple it was. There's a sneaky little bit of maths hiding at the top which calculates what the movement delta should be for each key press or mouse movement. It's a little bit mathsy again and relies on using sine and cosine again to work out which way we should swing the camera. I also crammed it into a Razor, a Razor Pages file and stuck it on a web server. Literally, I just pasted all the code into the code behind of a single form, and it lets you edit the map in the text box on the page to change the camera angle. And, um, and you can click Submit, and it will render a new world in your web browser. Mostly, I honestly did it to just see if it would work. There are plenty more places to take this prototype, so it's obviously it's missing texture mapping on the walls, but we have a place for it in our code. We could implement surfaces that don't occupy 100% of the height of the space if they're encountered. You know, for instance, to implement half-height walls, which is you know, Gears of War. We could implement different surfaces, like glass materials that combine the colours of the pixels that the ray encounters as it passes through. This code absolutely isn't performance optimised, by the way, and realistically, it's not the kind of code you would write if you were building a 3D game today. But to me, this is an interesting curiosity, a technique from a more resource-constrained time. And the languages we have today are certainly capable of doing what was significantly harder then in a lot less code now. If you want to build games in C-sharp today, like use Unity or Unreal Engine with C-sharp bindings or Mono Game. But I really hope you've enjoyed coming on this journey with me of just exactly how old games hung together. Um, the code for the sample is available as a gist here. Paste it, play with it, have fun, take a screenshot, pause the video, there's, there's a few more slides to go. So, the most obvious question when we're talking about ray casting is, well, is this the same as ray tracing on all these latest GPUs? Well, sort of. This is an incredibly scaled back example of casting rays, the modern version of which is more often called ray tracing. And while the terms were used interchangeably at one point in history, they definitely mean different things now. So when you hear of ray tracing or RTX cards, they're applying the same core concept shooting rays of light through a 3D space. But what they're doing that's different is instead of using rays to produce a 3D projection, they're normally using the rays to add lighting to an already rendered 3D polygonal mesh. They will use rays that bounce off from one surface to the next, changing the way light and colour is output in the resultant image. It's all very clever and very resource hungry. Now, a lot of modern ray tracing sub, uh, subsamples an image. What it does is it takes a lower res render, then casts rays across every single pixel of that, not just for each horizontal column, and then upscales the result of that ray traced subsampled image to enhance the render quality of a larger, higher resolution scene. Now, if you're interested in this, I'd recommend you watch the Digital Foundry teardowns of the Quake 2 RTX port that Nvidia produced to demo their RTX series of cards. It's really interesting. So, I want to leave you with a really small anecdote, and it's about a question I had when I was 10. Now, I remember trying to play Doom on an underpowered 486 and struggling with performance. One of the options in Doom was to reduce the size of the window that was built into the game. You could shrink the rendering and it would perform better. Similarly, I also played a lot of Doom on the much maligned Sega 32X add-on for the Genesis for the Mega Drive as one of like the seven owners of that short-lived add-on in the UK. It, it too was rendered in a smaller window. And I remember wondering to myself, why is it faster to run Doom when you reduce the viewable game size? And in writing this talk, I realised that of course it's because there are less pixels to render. Now Doom's BSP engine wasn't a raycaster, but simply by reducing the screen real estate, the rendering sped up. So I hope this talk has inspired you to try and work something out that you didn't think you could do. I approached this topic uh, with the trepidation of someone that had never studied maths to a particularly high level. And I had a lot of fun working out all the details on the way. So I'd never written a 3D renderer of any kind before, and I want to remind everyone that, like, programming for fun is totally, totally okay. <laughs>
do fun things. You'll you'll love it. I'm available on all the internet. Tweet at me. Tell me I know nothing. Tell me you love me. Ask for the code. I would love to hear from you. And please enjoy the rest of the conference, everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs>